Ron, um, on the subject of lions, um, you brought it up now, uh, the sad story of Len Harvey, tragic lion attack. Okay, this is a long story. Uh, Len was one of my colleagues and he was, uh, he was the game warden in charge of the culling operations, which, had, which were, I think this was about 1972. Um, from 1965 onwards, they were doing elephant culling operations inside Wanky National Park. Uh, they had, the, the staff doing this had, um, had made a camp about, it must be about 30 or 40 miles away from main camp up in a place called Sharpie. Um, and it was way, oh, it, Sharpie Pan was, was not, was closed off to tourism. They had all their, all their accommodations there, but their accommodations were, were Pearl and Daga huts as instead of tents, windows in a hut. So were just open spaces, the size of a window in the side of the hut. Um, the, most of them had no doors. Some of them had doors. Um, most of them had no doors. So they were just really big shelters with uh, Pearl and Daga walls and holes here and there where you could get in and out of them. There was a, um, um, a staff compound where the, where the laborers stayed. They all had doors. They wouldn't live there unless they had doors because the lions would, would wander through all these areas at night and somehow the, the white man um, tolerated them, the black man wouldn't. And the black man <laughs> was, was cleverer than we were, obviously. Anyway, um, Len was 57 years old when, when this happened. Um, it, was the, it was the wet season. The, they had heavy rains. All the pans were full. All the, all the tracks through the Kalahari sand areas were swamped with water. Um, you, you couldn't operate anywhere. We, all the meat from the elephants, that, and they were taking buffaloes off as well, um, all the elephants and the buffalo meat was all dried out. Um, there was no the, there was no refrigeration tested because it was all dry meat is is the, is the common fare in southern Africa, and um, everybody went off. They said we can't operate here anymore because of the rains. Everything was sopping wet. We couldn't use vehicles. We were getting bogged down and this sort of thing. So Len decided, he said, listen, guys, we're not doing us, ourselves any good. We're not progressing with our job. Um, I declare the next month is a holiday. So you guys can go, take leave, go wherever you want to go. Some of the guys left and they went down to the South Coast on, on holiday. Others went and did other things. Len Harvey at 57 years old went and got married for the first time. And the, the basic camp was maintained by um, Willem de Beer, Willem, game warden Willem de Beer. Willem had been the RSM of the Territorial Army Unit in Rhodesia, which is a very great honor. The uh, regimental uh, sergeant majors are only appointed by the troops, by the senior officers. And uh, he was very much respected. He was a big, a very big, strong man. He was a good hunter. He, um, he after 20 years in the army, he resigned. And he joined, came and joined us in national parks. And he and his wife, Hazel, um, stayed on at, at Sharpie, looking after the camp, making sure supervisors. And um, everybody else disappeared. All the young game rangers took advantage of this to go and visit their girlfriends or go and have parties or whatever it was. So um, that was the ground status quo of the camp. Now, during the year, a lioness had taken to coming into the, when they cleaned all the meat off the bones, they took the bones and they stacked the bones in an ossuary um, outside the, the camping areas where the sun could, could dry it out and the, um, the bones could dry and, uh, and, and not go fraught because the bones, when they were cleaned, um, were ground up for, for bone meal, for, for cattle stock and for fertile. So this line, this lioness had taken to, to living in the ossuary and it used to chew the, the little bits of meat off the ends of the bones that were still there. There was lots of, there, cumulatively, there was a lot of meat there, but that had to be nibbled and pulled off. And she ended up doing this. Now, I, I think what you've got to understand about lions is that when they are 22 months of age, they are kicked out of the prides by the big males and the big females. 
And um, they then have to go and find another place of their own to live because if they stayed with a big pride, the big males would kill them and probably eat them as well. But um, this lioness had surviving and that is to go and live in the ossuary and eat the meat off the bones. Now, she, was she became dependent upon the meat on these bones to stay alive. She was well known, everybody knew her, she caused them no problem at all. But what, what they hadn't worked out was that when it rained like this and everyone went off for a month and there, were no, there was no culling going on, there were no new bones coming into the ossuary and the lioness had nothing to eat. So it got very, very hungry. And it took to raiding the chicken coops in the, in the, in the native staff compound. They had chickens there in, in, behind, next to their huts. And the lioness used to come in here, pull, pull all the wire down, catch the chickens and eat them. And then it started to try and push the doors open to get at the people inside. Just wooden plank doors, that's all they were. They weren't proper doors. They, they were put into Poland dogger huts and they had thatched roofs. And she even tried to pull the thatch off, off the roofs. And she became a bit of a problem. And, um, Willem de Beer got worried about this and he he didn't have the authority to shoot the lion because he wasn't in charge of the camp but that was his inclination and when Len Harvey came back with his new bride on his arm he said to him Len we've got a problem if we don't take this lioness out she's going to kill somebody and eat them she's already trying to push into the doors of the black compound black people in the compound she's eaten all their chickens and, and, and she's a problem. She has been eating off the, off the ossuary. We are providing new, new bones. Uh, I would suggest that the first thing we do is we shoot a wildebeest and we put it out for her and, uh, and just take her away from her attacks on, on the human people there. No, he said, um, when the, the normal lion pride that lived in that area came around again, the big lions would chase her away, which never happened. He said also, he said, I've got a black mark on my record in that I had a similar problem before with a lion like this. And he says, I shot it. And he says, I've never stopped writing reports about it because everybody wanted to know why I shot a lion in the park, et cetera, et cetera. He said, I, I used my judgment and I killed the lion, which of course I think he should have been, had the right to do. But you know what civil servants are, are like? And, uh, so, and he said, no, she'll go away. She'll go away sooner or later. So. The very first night that he got back, he went back to occupy his, his quarters, which was a big bedroom. And it had window openings on the wall, four feet above the ground um, on both sides. It had an open doorway. It had electricity. There was a generator in the, in the officer's quarters area, which filled the whole camp up with lights. Um, and uh, he and his wife had a big double bed in there right underneath one of these windows. And uh, they would go to, night, go to bed at night with the lights on and, and read their books. Um, they go off, Willem went off to which it was, he flicked the lights telling everyone the light. This gave them time to put bookmarks in their books and put them on the table next to the bed. And then the lights went out. Now, after the first night, this lioness came into the officer's camp and it lay on the ground under the eaves under the open window of where Len and his wife were sleeping at night. And when, ben, when Len looked out, he saw the marks and everything. He called his wife over and he says, Ruth, come over here and have a look where this lioness was lying last night, right here next to us. It really is very tame. You don't have to worry about it. You know, she's, she's one of us, as it were. This is the story he told his wife. So anyway, everything went fine that day. The next, the next night, the same thing happened. Willem flicked the lights. Len and Ruth put book, bookmarks in their bar, put them on the side of the bed, and they turned over and went to sleep. And in the middle of the night, this lioness came in. It jumped up onto the window, through the window, onto the bed, through the mosquito net, because they had big mosquito nets. There were lots of mozzies around Wanky in, in the summer months. And... Um, it got on top of the bed and it started to maul Len's wife, Ruth. And and wriggling around in this in lions, even, even a young lioness is a big, powerful animal. And Len sat up in bed, grabbed this lion, this lioness, pulled it off his wife. And it came on top of him and it started mauling him. She got out, the bed collapsed. It was a bed, a bed with wooden legs. The bottom wooden legs collapsed. Um, she rolled out of the bed and she took out through the door and she ran right across the, 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 
the senior staff compound, which had a, a rudimentary lawn between all the huts, to one of the another hut across the lawn, which was probably about thirty yards away from the Harvey house, and uh, she she went there to get help from from Willem de Beer, um, and Willem heard this this person shouting outside. I know what it was. And uh, he went. He went out with a torch, and he saw Ruth standing there, absolutely stark naked, and she had been mauled and was bleeding all over the place. So he he pulled her to him into his own house and put her on the bed. And as he was doing, he was sleeping in in a, in a, an adjoining room within this primitive house. Um, she couldn't stand Willem snoring, so <laughs> she was just sleep in the next room. So she came in from the next room, hearing a bit of a kerfuffle going on, and she saw all this and she realized what had happened. And she and Ruth was saying to him, "Willie, please go and go over and um, save my husband. He's being he's being mauled by the lion in the hut." Now the lights were all off at this stage. Go over and see what he could do. But first of all. He couldn't go over in the middle of the night on. And he put the lights on, even the lights, because the lights, were, lights weren't switched off in the hut, they were still on, switched on. As soon as he opened the generator, all the lights came on throughout the whole camp. So now suddenly the camp was illuminated by lights, but Willem had to go out. It was raining outside. Before he left, um, Hazel, his own wife's son by a previous marriage, um, who had just come up, in South Africa, having got a, a, a university degree, um, he, he volunteered to go with, with Willem. What Willem didn't know is this youngster didn't have, I mean, he was a university student, but he had no, no hunting experience whatsoever. He didn't know what a rifle was. So Willem didn't know this. Um, so the two of them went off to the office. They opened the gun cabinets. They took out two rifles in the darkness. And Willem gave one to an orc because they were fighting a with the uh, nationalist terrorists and um or freedom fighters and um they then went out and they switched the generator on and uh, it was drizzling with rain still all the lights lit up this youngster colin said, listen i don't know how to fire a rifle i don't know what to do what do i have to do with this rifle now here's this kid for the first time in his life being given a rifle a 243 rifle as it was um to go and hunt a man-eating lion. So anyway, Willem loaded the weapon for him, put it on or safe, and he said, you hang on to this. Don't use it unless you have to. But if the lion comes to you, just point it and pull the trigger. Just take it off safe and pull the trigger. That was his instruction. Willem then went with a, with a 375 Magnum. That, again, also they had rounds in the magazine. He didn't even bother to get extra rounds. He, he put one up the spot, put it on, on, um, on safe, and then about, I think it was, I think he said it was 60 meters from the office to Len's house. And all the way, he was, as they were walking quietly through, the, it was drizzling with rain, um, they were looking and listening for lions and lions eating something. At that stage, Willem, I think, had given up the ghost. He didn't think there would be any chance that Len was still alive. He knew lions. He'd had experience with lions. So they, they got to, 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 to the Harvey house and, and Willem took the safety catch off his weapon and holding it at the ready, he went up to the door. The thatch now was coming down over the top of his head behind him. So he walked up, put his head under the thatch so that he was standing next to the wall and looking through this opening, looked through the window. The lights were all on inside and he was looking for the lion. He couldn't find the lion. He couldn't see it anywhere. And he didn't want to get too close because he didn't know where it was inside the room. The bed he could see had collapsed. So, and there was blood. He got fairly close and looked to see if he could see anything. And he thought, that's silly. I, I mustn't penetrate the room because then the lion will come for me. So he was going to back off and go in through the door to see what was happening there. But as he backed off, the thatch behind him he, he moved back from the window but the thatch behind him hit him on the back of the head and he wasn't expecting it he stumbled and he fell forward and his head and shoulders went through the window and there right under the window was his lion lying there it had, it had been eating len's chest and neck and, and all the things around his head he was dead and um, 
And the lion saw him and it just came out of the window for, just in one straight leap came, wow, through the window. Got on, bounced on top of the window, on top of him on the outside. And it pushed him right through the thatching grass and onto the ground outside. These are big, heavy animals, a lion, even a, even a lioness. And um, it got him on the ground, roaring and, and, and growling and hissing and all, all the things these lions do. And it bit the hell out of him all, all over his face and, and his shoulders and, and, and what have you. Remember, he was, just, he was just wearing a pair of rugby shorts, that's all. No shoes, no nothing, and a rifle. Because he'd run over as quickly as he could to try and help Len. So, so then the lion really mauled him. You know how badly he was mauled? Willem, Willem was my two IC when I was in Salisbury, near head office, next, right, with my office right next to our head office, when I was the provincial game warden in charge of Mashonaland South Province. And Willem was my two IC, so I got to know him very well. And he told me all these details intimately, straight from, his, from the horse's mouth, as it were. And, and what happened then was that the lion had opened up a wound uh, that cut the skin on, uh, on, on Willem's head from, from behind the crown of his head, right across his head, right down his forehead, through his eyelid and down into the cheek. It was right through to the flesh and bone beneath. That, there was another one higher up, but that was the main one. His eye... Because it had no eyelids to keep the eye in place, the eye fell out onto his cheek. And there was a string of, of sinews and, and um, I suppose, a little capillaries joining the eye still to, to the function inside the brain. Um, so, so, and, and his neck and everything was very badly um, beaten. His, his nose was crushed. The lion bit him across the nose and this, his whole face went into the lion's mouth and it just crushed his whole face with its teeth. Um, and he required to get this fixed his face to keep to, to put it back in position. And the lion was mourning him like hell. And he, he said he realized there wasn't anything he could do. The lion was just too big and too powerful. So he lay there and he feigned death. And then the lion has stopped mourning him and it started licking all the blood off his face. And he said all sorts of funny things went through his mind then. He said, she doesn't want to kill me anymore. She wants to be friends. She's licking my face. These were the funny things that went through his brain. And then suddenly the lion, now this, look, I think what you've got to understand is all this happened in a flash of a few seconds. It certainly didn't happen in the time I'm telling you that it happened. And anyway, Willem was lying there. And, the, and when the lion looked up there, standing right next to the lion was young Colin with his rifle in his hands. And he, he was trying to get the safety off. He'd forgotten how to put the safety off. And this lion just left, then left Willem. He, his neck and shoulders and everything were also very badly more in his chest. And uh, it then went, the lioness went for young Colin. And it, the first thing it saw was his leg right next to him. So it bit him through the knee and it crushed all the joints, all the bones in the joint with one bite in his joint there. Then it got him down and started mauling him also. And Colin was lying on the ground screaming and shouting. And uh, obviously he's facing death with this lion. And Willem, on, he couldn't see anything because all the skin on his head had fallen down his face. So all he could see when he opened his eye was, was a little bit of, of, light, of light. That was all. He couldn't see anything, but he could see the aura of light coming into his one eye. Um, and he was feeling around for, for where his rifle was. And he felt something and he, it felt like a pickaxe handle. And he said to me, he said, you know, funny how you think under these cushions. What the hell was a pickaxe handle doing out in the bush at Sharpie? And he couldn't understand it. Anyway, he picked it up and then he discovered it was the pistol. He was hanging onto the pistol grip of Colin's rifle, which was a 243, and he was loaded with softness. So he, he knew it was fully loaded because he had loaded it and he'd put it on safe for young Colin and he, that, he dropped it. And that's what he, what he picked up. He took it off safe towards where he heard the lion growling and where he heard Colin screaming. So he aimed at the growls and he pulled the trigger and then he loaded another trigger, another, I think he fired three rounds. And what happened next was that suddenly he felt a weight fall over the top of, of him, of his legs. Because um, the lion was standing with over the top of his of, of 
Willem's legs, his back legs on the one side, his front legs there, and Colin on the other side. So when he killed this lion, he shot it through the body and through the brain with the very first shot. It collapsed on top of his body and he shot his son, his stepson, or whether it was a lion's body, he didn't know. And he couldn't see because his eyes were all covered over. Then what happened was that uh, uh, he, he was sitting there and he was off from this because all the bones in the flesh of his wrist had been shattered by the soft nosed bullet. And uh, Willem said to him, forget about your wrist. And Just remember, you, you still, you've still got your head. You've still got <laughs> can you your stop, head. Can you stop there? Um, unfortunately, the quality of the call is deteriorating. Um, at about the point where um, Len started shooting, uh, you froze. So what actually happened once once he started shooting towards the sound? Yes. Uh, right up until now, we, we lost okay. all that. He's got this 243. He manages to get the safety off. But he's still got the flap of skin over his face. And he fires towards the sound. If you could just yes. pick up from there. Okay. He, he aimed at the, at the growling sound. And he pulled the trigger. And what we know now is that that first bullet went into the lion's body, through the lion's body, into its head and through its brain and it killed it. Sure. But the lion had been standing over the top of, of, where, um, of where Willem was lying, over his legs. It's black feet on the side and his head was beyond Mauling Colin. So when he killed the lion, I mean, he, the, the barrel must, must have been right on the animal's body. And... Um, and also was mauling him around the head and the neck. And, and um, Willem had fired three shots, I think, altogether. And the one had gone through, gone through Colin's wrist. It had blasted away all the bone structure on his wrist. And his hand oh, okay. was hanging, hanging by a bit of skin off his body. And, and Willem didn't know any of this. Except that he said to Colin, are you all right? He said, yes, I'm all right. I'm still alive. Or he said, are you all right? Are you still alive? And Colin said, yes, I'm all right. I'm still alive. But you shot, you shot my, my hand off. And he put it up and he showed Colin. Um, Willem, Willem couldn't see it. He didn't know what he was talking about. But he said, damn your hand. He said, it could have been your head. So thank you, lucky star. <laughs> Attitude. <laughs> and he wasn't angry with Colin in any way. He was just frustrated by the whole thing. And uh, he then tried to get up and he, he couldn't, he found he couldn't get up. His whole neck and everything was pouring with blood. So he, he managed to, to, to get the line, push the line off his feet. And he then turned around and he started shuffling backwards with his hands on the ground and shifting his bum backwards bit by bit until his back was up against the wall. And then he tried to push himself to where the window was, where the, the lion had come through. And when Colin saw this, he decided, he realized that he mustn't complain about his arm or anything and his knee. He said he, he then saw what a bad condition Willem was in. So he then went over and, and helped him to his feet. And they got out from underneath this and the, the rain had stopped, but everything was still wet. And uh, um, Willem could see that there was light about, but he couldn't see anything. But he could walk. There was nothing wrong with his legs. Now, Colin couldn't walk because the lion had mauled his knee. But he could see. <laughs> picked him up. Willem's a big, strong man. A very big strong man. He picked him up and said, right, tell me where I must walk. So they walked across, across the compound. And they got, to, they got to his house, which had a door. And... Um, when he opened the door and walked in, Hazel had Ruth on the bed and was treating her lion maulings around the neck and, and what have you. Um, and then in comes her husband with the skin of his head, his head bald to the bone right the way through because all the skin had fallen off his head. It had fallen down the front of his face. His head was just raw skull. All this inside skin was hanging over his, over his face, over his eyes. His one eye was hanging beneath that on a, on a cord. And she could see that he was being very badly mauled around the shoulders. And there was her son um, with his knee crushed, his 
a hand hanging off the lot or off his arm. You know, that must have been a very terrible thing for anybody to see. I knew all these people, all of them. So anyway, excuse me, I'm a bit emotional. Um, anyway, what happened then was that Hazel got, got Willem down. She pulled everything in, in place. She put his eye back in his socket. She put a towel over his head and over his shoulders and wrapped him up um, and put him on, on another bed. She put Colin to one side. She fixed his knee up. She, um, she fixed the wounds on his shoulders and everything. By then, by then um, Ruth was, was, had been pretty well doctored up a bit. And um, she was asking about her husband. How is Len? So Willem realized that she was listening and he said, oh, Len's all, uh, no, Len's all right. We'll just have to go and see to him again. When you finish with us, Hazel, you'll have to go over and look at Len. And it was a lie. Um, it was a lie. Now, Hazel had um, her husband in a terrible state. She had Len Harvey dead, the body in there. She had her son with his knee bitten. And... Um, it, it was a terrible set of circumstances. She then, uh, Colin had come up with a young friend and two girlfriends from, from Natal and they were all staying together in the house. And um, um, Hazel and one of the girls went over and found Len dead. And um, the other lion, the other pride, far away was roaring in the distance. And, uh, but they found Len half eaten and in, in realized he was dead. They took, um, sheets off the beds and covered his body and came back and she told her <coughs> husband that he was dead there was nothing they can do about it so now this is about one or two o'clock in the morning and it's raining outside and it's as dark as hell and they had to do a 30 or 40 miles drive to go back to main camp there was no radio in those days the radio only operated during days of out of 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 sun hours of, of daylight so so then what happened was um willem said to to hazel hazel i'm sorry to tell you this but you are going to have to get in the land river go and find the, the 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 chief game scout black guy in charge of, of all the scouts and the staff there and get him to come and help so she went out there and, and got him to come. The shooting and everything had been heard by everybody. So she was able to shout and get the guy to come over and um, told him what had been going on and said that she, he now had to go with Hazel to main camp in the rain, um, 30, 40 miles away. Fortunately, it was a tarmac road, but to get onto the tarmac road, they had to go through deep puddles of, of road in, on the dirt road. And uh, she took the other young man with with her in for company in the land in it, it was supposed to be in 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 the land rover willem said the land rover she said no I, I don't know how to drive all the things in the land rover i'm going to take my little vw beetle which she did she got onto the tomat road and uh, and she drove like hell for main camp because you know her husband everybody was was in on death's door so this youngster got frightened of the way she was driving because she was driving like a mad thing and she was passing elephant herds, going through buffalo herds and all sorts of things at, the, at that time. And he kept switching off the engine to stop her driving so fast. And of course, this just aggravated the whole situation so badly. And he was, he was a real city slicker like her son was. And um, so he complicated everything. But she eventually got to main camp, I think about two o'clock in the morning. And she just hammered, sat on the hooter <laughs> Work up all the whole camp, including visitors, including staff, including Boyd Reese, who was the, the provincial warden in charge of Wanky at the time. And um, she also woke up the senior tourist officer there who helped her. He then, Willem, Willem being in the army, knew all the people in the Air Force. And he knew that there was a, a helicopter squadron. Remember, they were fighting a war. There was a helicopter squadron in Wanky Town, which was 80 miles away from main camp. So he got onto them. He got hold of the commanding officer there, who was a friend of Willem's, and told him what had happened. And he arranged for a helicopter to come out and casavac them off to hospital. He alerted they alerted the hospital in Wanky um, that there were incoming victims to, of this attack. And um, then 
Then she turned around and drove back to, to Sharpie, not knowing what she would find. And she brought back with her two, two young white game rangers from main camp, who is what was happening in Sharpie from her. They also brought back flares to guide the chopper in. They, they did all sorts of things like that, uh, cleaned everything up, got everybody ready for, for Kasavak. Now, eventually, at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, um, an Alouet 3 helicopter of the Air Force came in. It was guided by the lights of the camp. Um, it was totally overcast. I did my training as a pilot in the Air Force, and I know that helicopters, the helicopters of those days couldn't fly without a natural horizon. Um, and you had to see the horizon to be able to keep your, your aircraft steady in flight. Now, this was a dead, absolute dead of night, rain, overcast, low cloud. How the hell they did it? I don't know. <clears throat> but they, they um, eventually landed in, in, in the square right in, in, in front of all, all the, the things. They, they loaded up Willem and Ruth and young um, Colin. Um, tie them onto stretches and put them in the aircraft. And then they, they, he brought a, the pilot, um, brought a, a, a paramedic with him who saw to everybody. They were all in a bad way. And, um, and he flew off to, to, to Wanky, to Wanky Hospital with them. Hazel couldn't go. There was no room in the aircraft for her. So she had to drive back to main camp all the way around the roads to get to, to the hospital in Wanky to see what was happening. And um, they, they all survived. Colin has still got his hand, although he's lost use of it. Um, they, he had steel plates in his face to hold his head apart. He had, he had, they had to do sections of his eyelids, um, V sections to, to shorten the length of the one eyelid. Uh, in order for it to keep his eye in place in his skull. Um, uh, he, th there, were, there were nuns there. It was a Roman Catholic hospital. And Willem never saw them for weeks. And uh, <laughs> he said, that, uh, he, said that, that he was always embarrassed because he had been so badly mauled up that the mauling, the wounds on his face, his head and his chest and his neck were all filled with um, putrefying flesh, flesh that had been unable to heal. And it was rotting off on his body. And he had this stench of rotting flesh for weeks on end. So anyone who came to visit him, he couldn't see them. Um, he couldn't talk with them for a, a long while. Um, but they could smell him and he was very embarrassed by it. But after three or four months in hospital, Willem himself got out of hospital and uh, he had many operations to his eyes to get it working right. His, the rest of his wounds seemed to heal pretty well. He was a tough old bugger. And um, he, then, he then became my 2IC because he had to be near doctors and things for all the additional medical attention. So he had to be somewhere in near head office and I needed a, a two IC. So he, he then filled in and I got to know the whole story start to finish. So that's the story, which I call the Sharpie bloodbath. The hell of a story. Sure it is. Um, Ron, I think that's, that's enough for today. Um, the, I'm a bit worried about the audio that keeps breaking off, but thank you for, sharing and thank you for your emotion i think it makes it more real for all of us um 